change, coronavirus, Black Lives Matter, marine plastics, these all give us the opportunity to fix broken systems. And so we welcome you all to this panel discussion where we will be addressing marine plastics. We're so glad you could join us. First, a couple of housekeeping announcements for this webinar. As the discussions proceed, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. You're free to address specific questions to panelists directly by adding their name to your question or raise a question directly to the entire panel. <clears throat> please only use the Q&A function so we can see your questions. The chat function will not work for this discussion. Thank you very much and we look forward to your questions. Now, back to our regular programming. Marine plastics is an issue that has captured <clears throat> the attention of the public across the board. Whether you join the chorus at, after watching some of the content that went viral about the straw in the nose of a turtle, or whether you were an early adopter um, of a clean, healthy oceans idea, we cannot deny that this is one of the challenges of our time. Can we fix it? The group of those let's call them stakeholders, trying to answer this question has grown considerably over the last decade. But the term marine plastics is almost a, a misnomer. We all know that the plastic that is choking marine ecosystems originates on land. So to address it, we have to address the plastic supply chain that ends up leaking into the ocean. My name is Talash Kantai, and I'm a researcher with the One Ocean Hub hosted by the University of Strathclyde. For the past year and a half, I've been focusing my time studying the international governance of marine plastics and all the stakeholders involved in this area. On the panel today, I'm privileged to have Joyce Kashuhi from Petco Kenya, Tatiana Luhan from Client Earth, and Charles Kosori from the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. Our work this afternoon is to showcase the work that they are doing to help fix the plastic leak from regional, national and local perspectives and to discuss some of the complexities of this work as more stakeholders begin to take concrete measures to decrease the flow of plastic into the marine environment. So without further ado, let me introduce Joyce Gashuki. Currently, she's the country manager of the Kenya Pet Recycling Company Limited, Petco Kenya, the first registered and operational producer responsibility company in Kenya. In her role, she's driving collective action within the pet plastic packaging sector towards responsible production and consumption. Joyce is an alumnus of Kenyatta University, a member of the Environmental Institute of Kenya, and a registered environmental impact assessment lead expert with the National Environmental Management Authority, NEMA, in Kenya. Joyce, you have the floor. Thank you, Talash. Um, so first, let me express um, my appreciation for having this opportunity to share a few findings and a little bit about the work and insights into what we are doing as industry. Um, plastics and industry in the same sentence usually means that uh, industry is bashed for being the primary polluter. So in some light it is true because they are the manufacturers but there is a role that consumers you and i have to play as well and so i'll be sharing a little bit about what we are doing some of our successes and toward the end of my presentation i'll share with you a little bit about what we're doing to reduce the flow of plastics to the marine ecosystems here in kenya So I'll run you through just a brief overview of who we are as Petco. Um, for those who are participating in this workshop, um, you are probably familiar with the extended producer responsibility model that of course has been operational in a lot of uh, the global north. Um, in emerging nations and in Africa more specifically, we have a model that has been running in South Africa 
This is the PETCO model. Um, I'll give you some insights as to what that is. But the PETCO model is one that has allowed the recovery of polyethylene terephthalate, PET, plastic bottles, largely from the beverage sector, uh, post-consumer, and putting it back into uh, recovery through recycling for manufacture of either fiber or production of new resin uh, outside in external markets out of Africa. So as Talash mentioned, we are Kenya's first industry-led voluntary extended producer responsibility. We've been operational for two and a half years now. Uh, we have brought together members of the beverage sector and any other entity that is using PET or plastic bottles or packaging as their primary packaging within their value chains. We are financed largely from the EPR fees, extended producer responsibility fees or grants. The reason why we are still reliant on some grants is because our model is still voluntary. We have no legislative framework in our country as yet, um, although it is being developed currently, but as yet we do not have any legal framework that governs our, our operations, and hence our financing model has to adopt support from a multilateral approach, hence the EPR fees and the grants. So our strategic direction is simple. Um, this is the um, same across every EPR globally, which is to focus around raising consumer and industry awareness promoting collection and recycling, as well as building partnerships. Um, plastics is really a big elephant and uh, we must all seek to bite it one piece at a time, no pun intended, but you cannot do it alone and neither can industry on their own be able to pull off the recovery of post-consumer waste by themselves. And so we partner with government, with civil society and any like-minded individual who is looking to recover this material we also have been able to raise awareness um, from truth consumers and industry to be able to create an understanding of what PET packaging is. Can it be recovered? For most people prior to inception, a lot of people didn't know that PET or plastic bottles can be recovered. And that is why you have seen a lot of African governments banning plastic bottles. Aside from the fact that there is natural and, of course, consumer-driven leakage into the natural environment, there's also a lack of understanding as to what value actually uh, a PET bottle carries. So our overarching objective is to really create a circularity. So following, of course, under the leadership and guidance of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we are keen to promote circularity. Um, in Africa, um, like most other emerging uh, nations, circularity is still not readily available. And by circularity, I'm talking about the conversion of a post-consumer bottle into new resin that goes into making a new bottle. Right now, what the bulk of the recovered material is going into doing is to make PET flakes or pellets that are being exported either externally or being used locally to make fiber. And of course, there's a general consensus and even amongst ourselves, PETCO's membership and leadership included, that we will not be able to achieve optimum circularity by producing fiber as the upcycled material. And so of course, the desire is to be able to generate uh, content that can go into new bottles and hence achieving circularity. So who are our members? Our membership is comprised of uh, brand owners. These are companies or entities that uh, own brands of products but do not necessarily manufacture locally. Um, of course, one of the most common and widely known brand owners is Coca-Cola. Uh, we also have converters. These are importers of PET resin, PET plastic resin and, and polymer into the country who then go ahead to make preforms or um, new bottles or packaging from the PET resin. Then of course we have the bottlers and we have the large scale retailers because they are the primary interface between the consumers and the manufacturers. So to date, we've been able to grow our membership. Um, our current membership 
controls about 60% of the beverage sector. And that has allowed us to be able to raise funding to be able to drive our strategic objectives, especially around uh, subsidizing of the recycling activities in the country, as well as promoting uh, collection throughout the nation. We've also, as I mentioned, uh, partnered with several entities from the Retail Trade Association, the Residence Trade uh, Association of Kenya, the Private Sector Alliances, uh, as well as the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. We've also been fortunate to uh, win a grant uh, that has gone into supporting and promoting pilot projects because one of the challenges we have in Africa, like in most places, is that segregation at source is still very difficult um, and actually not widely implemented. And as you know, to be able to achieve optimum circularity, especially when it comes to the recovery of uh, material that is going back into food grade use, then traceability of where our source of product is coming from becomes very critical and integral to the success of the project. In Europe, you have the return deposit schemes. Here in Africa, our retail systems are organized differently. And so through the partnership of, with the retail trade association, we are looking at different interventions on how we can recover material, but over and above, how can we partner with the Kenya Residents Association to promote through pilot projects just as, as, as of now, uh, segregation at source. And so we are working with national government to be able to do that. So before Petco came in, um, the extended producer responsibility model was largely unfamiliar. Um, awareness around EPR has grown. Uh, probably a general survey we did showed that last year awareness had grown by up to 60%. And this is of course largely within the urban setting. So there's still some more work to be done. But what the beauty about what has happened in Kenya is that our national government, through the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, has been able to take uh, a front lead in being able to develop legislation and a governing legal framework that then would allow the EPR model to actually be implemented effectively. And so some of the milestones that we have been able to achieve is to work with government to develop the extended producer responsibility uh, model regulations. If you go in, into our national Ministry of Environment website, you'll be able to extract or download a copy of what the government is doing right now. We are currently at the stakeholder engagement phase. And so this has become a very robust activity led by government that is going to allow us to move from a voluntary scheme to a mandatory scheme, which then shifts the burden of responsibility to the manufacturers with actually with some liability uh, accruable to them. So as I said, Petco has been operational for two and a half years. And in the two and a half years we've been operational, we've been able to grow our market share in as far as what we are putting into the market. So Kenya is currently producing about 26,000 metric tons of plastic bottles per annum. So at 60%, our membership is controlling a, a, a huge segment. And so last year we were able to recycle 7,000 metric tons of what we put out. It might not look like it's much, it's 30%, but if we look at what was being recovered in previous years, if you look at 2016, you can be able to see only about 800 tons was being recovered. So to have grown that within about three years to 7,000 metric tons has largely been because of the support we are providing to recyclers and to waste collectors through our subsidy program. So our subsidy program works in the sense that we identify through our due diligence uh, system uh, recyclers that we can be able to support who are converting plus post-consumer PET packaging into either pre-processed flakes or pellets, largely mechanical recycling. That is what is happening in Kenya and for the export market. Once we determine that they have a solid demand, we are then able to enter into contractual agreements with them for a period of uh, one year that is renewable. And we are able to set targets um, through, of course, uh, 
consistent engagement and analysis of what the market trends are internationally and locally, as well as what the price of crude oil, which is a direct factor that influences the success of recycling. So with that, we have been able to grow capacity locally from 30% in 2017 to now it's 50% and still growing. Our government has also been able to provide some tax incentives for new entrants into the plastics recycling sector as of last year through our national treasury. And so with that, we've been able to see additional investment and scaling up of existing operations. So as I said, uh, I'll mention what we are doing to reduce uh, marine uh, flow of plastics into the marine ecosystems. In 2019, we are part of a group of people, of an entity that partnered with the International Union of Conservation of Nature, IUCN, as well as its other partners and the Kenyan national, the national government here in Kenya, to be able to undertake a project that is going to map the flows of plastic from our mainlands to the oceans. As you know, the bulk of flow of plastics that are getting into our ocean ecosystems are not really emanating entirely from the beaches or the riparian ecosystems. They are largely coming from the mainland, getting into the rivers and then draining into the oceans. And so what we have been able to do to date is to generate a report that has mapped out the flow of plastics. We have been able to identify the different localities that are and the different hotspots where plastic flows are really being discharged. And with that, our desire is to provide interventions, especially to us in the private sector. Where can we put in our resources to be able to uh, reduce what is going into, and not necessarily reduce, our overall goal is to actually prevent it in totality. But at a minimum, we need to start reducing what is going into the oceans. As uh, you know, a lot of our informal uh, or marginalized communities, these are the slums uh, here in Kenya, they are found along the river causeways. And what that has meant is these rivers have then become the receptacles for a lot of the waste in from those communities. And so having identified, for instance, uh, one of the largest slums as a hotspot of this, then the question is how do we then go into those communities and trigger a shift into not just how they are handling waste, but how better can government engage and provide services to these communities so that then we can be able to prevent that waste from getting into the oceans. And that is all for me. Thank you. Over to you, Talash. Sorry, I just lost my mic function for a, for a minute. Thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, here we go. Thank you so much, Joyce. I think it's very interesting to hear about you know sort of going into this new era of liability to producers and i really want us at some point during this discussion to explore that a little bit more but it's it's really been quite illuminating thank you so much joyce uh, let me now introduce uh, tatiana luhan who leads client earth's work on plastic uh, on plastic pollution prior to joining client earth she worked for the london school of economics and political science focusing on relations between china and latin america and the impact of those relations in the quality and enforcement of environmental relations in the region. Before moving to London for Client Earth, she worked for the, chamber, the chambers of Julio Enrique Gonzalez Villa. I hope I got the name right. Perfect. One of, Colum one of Colombia's most renowned environmental lawyers on several groundbreaking cases concerning environmental issues. Uh, Tatiana is qualified as a lawyer in Colombia. Go ahead, Tatiana, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in this webinar. So I'm going to talk a bit about our work on plastic pollution. Um, we, I agree with everything Joy said about the importance of extended producer responsibility. We are concerned about the growing impacts of plastic pollution on biodiversity, climate, and human health. Um, producing plastic and the whole life cycle of plastic is incredibly climate intensive 
and it's projected by by 2050 it's going to consume 10 percent of the world's carbon budget and the life cycle emissions of plastic production plants are going to be sorry from the plastics life cycle are going to be the equivalent of at least 296 coal plants by 2030. We are all familiar with the effects on ocean biodiversity. So we, as Salash mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, have seen the pictures of seahorses holding Q-tips or of turtles with straws um, in their noses. But plastic, when it is in the ocean, degrades into microplastics. And those microplastics absorb toxic chemicals that are in the water and that way toxic chemicals enter the food chain and bioaccumulate. But beyond the ocean, the microplastics are now on fresh water, on the atmosphere, on soil, and they have important effects, for example, in our lung health, where those same toxic chemicals remain even for decades, affecting the way our lungs function. And also, they affect the fertility and physical qualities of the soil. So microplastic pollution has an important effect in food security. On human health issues, we are of course very concerned about the endocrine disruption caused by the toxic chemicals and plasticizers that are added to plastics and those that plastic absorbs from the environment because many of those toxic chemicals not only bioaccumulate in the human body through bioplastics, uh, through microplastics in the food chain, but also can leach from food contact materials to the food we're eating. Also, because only 9% of the plastic that has ever been produced has been recycled, much of the plastic that is produced is incinerated and when that plastic is incinerated, it releases not only the carbon that is captured in the plastic, but the toxic chemicals that were in that plastic too. And there is environmental racism and classism in where plastics are produced and where plastics are incinerated. Usually plastic production plants and plastic incinerators, waste incinerators um, are built closer to the most vulnerable communities and many times those communities are indigenous communities or communities of color. So from client earth we're trying to improve the law to make sure that those externalities that the plastics industry and when I talk about the plastics industry if we look at it deeply I'm really talking about the fossil fuel industry because most of the plastic we use and produce in the world is created from fossil fuels. And there is a lot of vertical integration between fossil fuel companies and plastic production. Plastic is the fossil fuel industry's plan B. They know that with the Paris Agreement and with public awareness about the climate impacts of burning fossil fuels, they won't be able to continue their business in the near future. So they're trying to divert their investments and divert their production into the production of plastic and therefore are driving the supply of the markets and flooding the markets with unnecessary plastic. In my lifetime, I, I have seen how we can find more and more and more applications for plastic we didn't even think about more sachets wrapped in more sachets, things we never considered we needed until they became usual and you could find them everywhere. This is not driven by demand from the consumers. This is driven by supply forced by the plastics production industry. What we're trying to do from a legal advocacy perspective is reform European law and UK law so that all these externalities and unnecessary uses are curtailed. We want to make sure that the costs of putting plastic in the market 
really reflect the costs that that plastic creates for human health, the environment and climate. So we worked on five directives related to plastic and we're also working on several directives related to corporate accountability to make sure that happens. Some of the provisions in some of the provisions in those directives include reforms to extended producer responsibility system, bans on some types of unnecessary plastic, bans on sub type of plastic substances like oxodegradable plastics, also reforms to the requirements of packaging to ensure that it is as minimal as possible. We're trying to drive reuse. We're trying to create a tax that is associated with virgin plastic pellets. We're trying to increase uh, recycling and we achieve an increase in the recycling rates that are mandatory in Europe for packaging, and there are many other reforms to come. The Global South has had real leadership in driving legislation around plastic. So while Europe is loaded for its directives and mainly the single-use plastics directive, countries like Kenya and India have also been leading the way. And it is very important that we listen to the countries from the global south that have been suffering the largest impacts of plastic pollution driven by companies in the global north who not only place their production plants and waste treatment facilities in countries in the global south and flood their markets while failing to consider that many of these countries do not have the waste management systems necessary to deal with all the plastic that is pushed in those markets because they use to leave lives and systems and distribution systems for their products that way, were way more sustainable than the ones used in the global north. So when companies in the global north push all these amounts of unnecessary plastic in countries that because they had more circular models from the get-go we're not prepared to deal with the amount of waste. We create health externalities and externalities for their public systems, their sewages, the quality of their ocean that the Global North is not being accountable for. That is why we're trying to use corporate law, European corporate law also, to make sure that the corporations in the Global North disclose to their investors and to other stakeholders like civil society their impacts on the environment and their business risks associated with plastic. Because we know that many times companies only respond to money. So we're trying to demonstrate to them that like climate change, plastic pollution presents business risks for these companies. Those business risks are associated with the damage to their reputation because they're being linked to the plastic pollution we see in many parts of the world. I don't know if you have seen brand audits by Break Free From Plastic showing, for example, Coca-Cola and Nestle being some of the worst polluters in the world because we can see plastic bottles branded with Coca-Cola and Nestle everywhere. Also, we're seeing, we're showing to companies the risks that changing legislation all around the world present for their businesses because adapting to changing legislation is expensive and the quicker you need to adapt, the more expensive it is. And the pressure from the public has been driving really, really fast changes in legislation. So by 2019, more than 127 countries had recently adopted legislation dealing with plastic and it keeps coming. There are also financial risks for companies related to litigation on plastic and financial risks dealing with physical impacts that plastic has created for some industries. So for example, the fisheries industry is really affected by plastic pollution. It's causing diversion of boats. It's causing damages to nets. It's causing contaminated catch. 
and it is also creating risks for the tourism industry. For example, Bali has had to be closed for several days and weeks in the last three years because there is so much ocean rubbish washing up in the beaches that the beaches need to be closed for cleanup. And that has repercussions on the profits that operators in the tourism industry, such as hotels, can expect. And lastly, litigation risks. People suing the plastic industry or companies that use plastic intensively for the damage they have created to the environment. We are behind one of these lawsuits. We are challenging the expansion of a petrochemical production plant in the port of Antwerp, Belgium. But we're part of a huge coalition of NGOs, a global coalition called Break Free from Plastic. And we are collaborating with many other NGOs to bring challenges to future expansion of plastic production plants. And lastly, we usually engage with stakeholders and the public to ask them to use their voice to continue pushing for changes in legislation and changes in corporate practice so that more schemes like the one Joyce spoke about can be successful so that governments feel the pressure to change their laws and so that companies feel the pressure to change their supply chains and their practices and rely less on single-use plastic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Sorry, I'm just trying to work this functionality again. I yes, keep yes. using the, the video button. Thank you very, very much, Tatiana. It's really, really interesting. I think it's a, it was a very loaded presentation and there were like very many things that you would need to unpack. I hope we can get to them um, during our, dis our more open discussion. But for now, let me introduce uh, Charles Kosoy. Uh, he is an environmental and analytical chemist working as a research scientist at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute based in Mombasa, Kenya. He is currently working on the ecological aspects of microplastic pollution in Kenya and Tanzania's marine and coastal environments, work that is funded by the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. Charles is also a Nat Geo explorer. I'm very happy to meet him and has been working on marine plastic pollution in Kenya with a special focus on the impact of the single-use plastic bags ban by the government in 2017. Charles, please go ahead. I think you'll need to unmute yourself, Charles. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to begin by saying that uh, the study that I'm carrying out was uh, motivated by the plastic uh, bags ban that was effected by Kenya government in 2017. Um, I got curious and therefore I wanted to find out whether there could be any impact uh, that uh, can come with it. Uh, uh, being incognizant to the fact that uh, plastics remain for quite a long time in the environment and therefore uh, even the plastic bags that were banned uh, were still uh, remaining in the environment. And again, considering that uh, other plastic materials uh, still remain unbanned. So I began by going along 
our beaches uh, along the Kenyan coast. And uh, the first thing I did was to find out the kind of plastic materials that uh, are found along the beaches. And uh, with a special focus on uh, single-use uh, carrier bags that were burned. And uh, I got this kind of uh, results, and uh, you can see their packaging and uh, wrappers materials uh, were quite a lot. Uh, this is considering along the whole coastal line of Kenya, and uh, followed by bottle tops, of course, from a bottle uh, or all sorts of bottles from beverages to water and uh, all kinds of bottles. And then uh, also you can see followed there by the single use plastic bag. This uh, it was actually a tremendous reduction. If it was there before uh, the ban, I believe uh, it would be taking the first, uh, 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 even more than the 47% that we are seeing for the packaging and wrappers material uh, here. So that was a big step by the government and we are happy for that. But again, you can see that all the other plastic materials are still existing. You could see there that uh, straws are still there at 4%. Uh, these are the things that are being used so much uh, by the people, especially along the public beaches. Uh, they are being used so much. You can see bottles are still existing. Um, and therefore, the, you can see there's still a challenge. Now, moving forward, after finding out uh, all the uh, types of uh, plastics that are found around, we went um, further and decided to categorize them into their sizes, uh, having in mind that uh, for any organism, any marine organism living around the beaches or the water, uh, the size of plastic material really matter uh, for it to be ingested or even entangle the organism. So I went ahead and found out how, what were the categories. And uh, the macro plastics, those with sizes uh, above five centimeters were the majority. Of course, that is expected. Uh, then followed by the mesoplastics, so those that uh, are between five millimeters and five centimeters, then the microplastics. Uh, and in this case, the microplastics that you are able to see by your naked eyes, that those are the large uh, microplastics that are between five millimeters and, uh, and one millimeter. Uh, this is uh, the categories that we found. We, of course, for now, uh, for, for the small microplastics, you are not able to see by your naked eye, and that was uh, beyond the scope of, of my study. So I, I even nanoplastics at the moment, uh, not very many people have uh, ventured into the research on nanoplastics, therefore we did not reach there. Uh, we went ahead, uh, just as I've mentioned that uh, size really matter for the plastic to be ingested by an organism. So do the types of microplastics that occur. Therefore, I went ahead again and did try to find out what types of uh, plastic uh, were available along our beaches. And we found that the fragments, these fragments are uh, fall under the type of uh, microplastics called uh, uh, called uh, um, right secondary microplastics. 
Now, these secondary microplastics are the ones that break down from the bigger particles to the smaller particles. And then we followed by the forms, the styrofoam. This comes from the styrofoam, uh, especially from the packaging uh, uh, part of it. And uh, followed the way in, in equal measure by fibers, films, and pellets. Um, this is important because uh, for them to be, uh, to entangle an organism, for them to be, uh, to be uh, ingested, the, the, the type really matter, just as the size also really matter. Even the color of the microplastics, also color because they, the, the organism tend to, to confuse them for food, uh, especially when they are colored, especially along the beaches where you have the, the nesting uh, grounds for turtles. They could uh, rather love to go for the colored one because they are easily seen. Also the shape of the plastic all matter so much and therefore we also uh, separated them into uh, various uh, shapes and you can see the irregular shapes, shapes that you could not really uh, find uh, how to, to identify it were quite a lot along the beaches. Therefore, this is something that is important uh, because it will uh, determine whether the plastic is going to be uh, ingested or it is in, still in a, uh, a, a, a still in a, in a shape that can just be uh, an entangling, an entangling uh, object. We also decided to find out the types of uh, uh, polymers that could be uh, responsible. And uh, uh, just as other researchers have found elsewhere, the P is PPs, the polypropylene, and the, the low-density polyethylene were the majority being followed there by PET, and uh, last was uh, polystyrene. Uh, for, uh, I have, Tatiana already talked about the uh, plastics uh, being capable of absorbing toxic chemicals, and some of the the, the precursors of this are uh, the surface of the plastic. When the surface of the plastic is probably rough or soft or smooth, this will determine how the plastic is going to be a better surface for absorption of the micro of, of the toxic chemical. And also that uh, whether the plastic is brittle. This one makes it, it uh, makes the plastic more uh, able to be able to, to, to break down uh, into smaller and smaller particles that end up being microplastics and even uh, nanoplastic. So this uh, also uh, motivated me to do a research, to write a proposal, so that I could go ahead and find out how much of this plastic now that we are finding along our beaches, how much can we find on the surfaces of our water? How much are we not seeing on the beach uh, that, are of, that are microscopic, that we cannot be able to see by our naked eyes? So therefore, how much can we see in the beach sediment? And how much can we see in the uh, bottom sediment, in the water, and surface water? So in the work that, we, that has been funded by the uh, Western Indian Ocean uh, Marine Science Association, we are trying to find out this. I took the I just uh, took the data on the Kenyan side 
I left out the data on the other side of Tanzania just for this uh, presentation. You will see that uh, in, uh, in Malindi, this is a, a town in the north, northern part of Kenya. And uh, you can see very high uh, uh, abundance of microplastics here in, uh, in surface water. And uh, for the work that Joyce and team are doing, that they are trying to reduce plastics getting into the, our rivers uh, so that they may not find their way or their destination into the ocean. This, is, this one shows clearly how rivers play very important role in the input of plastics into the ocean. This is about river Sabaki that comes into the ocean near Malindi town. And therefore this river comes all the way uh, from the industrial and uh, the industrialized areas like Nairobi uh, with all that uh, dense population. You will see that it is even higher than Mombasa, which is the capital uh, city of uh, the coastal region. Uh, this is because Mombasa uh, could be, we could just be having a few plastics that are coming from drainage system or the, the runoff and uh, therefore cannot be compared by the input from the rivers. Therefore, this uh, shows that the work that Joyce and team are doing uh, will be quite important in reducing plastics from getting into our ocean. Uh, these are some of the plastic uh, particles that are found around. Uh, you can see that they are big there. They are being shown to be big, but they have been magnified. And you can see they are of diff uh, different colors and with different shapes. This one uh, determines how the organism is going to, to uh, guest or is going to be entangled. Uh, it's not very clear here. This, this, this part here, this one here is, for, is from uh, sediment and you can see a, a red fiber there and a black fiber there. Uh, most of the, the sediment samples contained fiber. This is poss possibly could be coming from fishing nets or even uh, uh, the fibers from clothing where be when people wash clothes and then they get find their way uh, into the ocean. And then we can see also some fragments, this one and that one. And that marks the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Charles. Yeah. That was illuminating, and I think that it's it's also uh, as you as you've summed it up, like the way that that we we work, the way that we all work is we sort of follow the science and address those issues that science has 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 uh, pointed out to us. Um, before we get we get too deep into the the discussion, uh, I had asked each of you to bring a little bit of plastic with you and just sort of uh, discuss it. Uh, who would like to go first, Joyce? <laughs> uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, yes. Okay. So I have with me our clear PET bottle. And um, I wish I could zoom in to the bottom of the bottle where you can be able to see the number one in its triangle for the recycling symbol for PET, clearly marked. Uh, and of course the manufacturer of the bottle and of course it's bottle top. Mm -hmm. So why did I choose this particular piece of plastic today? Um, for obvious reasons, of course it's a PET bottle, but most importantly, it's to highlight some of the critical issues that are not just facing or plaguing uh, PET recycling in Kenya, but especially in um, Africa. 
So this bottle is clear. Mm -hmm. The bulk of bottles in Kenya are not clear. They're actually light blue. So the light blue tinge is what is over 75%, makes up over 75% of what comprises of PET packaging, largely for uh, drinking water uh, that is bottled. We have another segment that is colored bottles all together, different colors from white, uh, green, uh, brown, gold, and others. And the reason why I chose this bottle is to uh, talk about the fact that recyclability of a clear bottle is highest compared to the others. So one of the things that Petco is trying to drive is, is designed for recycling. So with our manufacturers and our partners and our membership, and even for those entities that are not our members, re design for recycling is critical. We can collect all the bottles in the country, mm -hmm. but if they're not the right color, then we find that collectors are not willing to collect them. They're not willing to collect them because the demand for colored bottles is not as high. It does not fetch a better price, actually fetches a much lower price. And in certain instances, to actually create enough volume or to collect enough volume of the colored bottles, especially the colored bottles like the gold and the brown becomes very difficult. And so what are we saying as Petco is, can we have clear bottles? Clear bottles, you, it's very easy to get them back into the value chain. Uh, collectors will readily pick them up. Uh, most of the bottles, as you can see from Charles Kosore's presentation, are colored bottles. And that's because they're not being collected as readily as the clear bottles. The other issue that we have today is the bottle top. So because it's a different plastic polymer from the PET, we find a lot of, and this is from a consumer point of view, which we are seeking to raise awareness and we have already started to do so, is for people to recap the bottle and bring it back. Our recyclers will then separate them and be able to recycle them separately. What this does is that it will reduce a situation where we have as, as um, uh, Charles said over 17% of what he collected from his study were bottle tops, and we don't want to have that. So we are trying to create a situation where we can recycle the entire bottle. Labeling is also a big problem. So labeling, we have a lot of labels that are made from PVC, uh, which of course pro is, is a contaminant when you're recycling PET, largely because of the densities of the two being similar uh, within the, the machines or the, the recycling plant lines, you will have PET and PVC settling at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is that it contaminates the end, the end material that is generated. Mm -hmm. What we are saying is, can we have a bottle uh, that either the ink can dissolve and if not that, a label either made from PET or one that can be readily blown out by a delabeling machine that is not stuck by glue. So that has already started changing. Very, um, we've seen exponential growth in that space with manufacturers. They've been able to adjust that labeling issue. And so now we have a lot of our packaging, our PET bottles with labels that can be blown away very easily. It's still an issue because as you saw with Charles, that is still forming a huge chunk of what is going into the, uh, the rivers because they are flimsy material, they are films. And so they get carried away and disposed very easily into waterways mm -hmm. but we are saying if we can have it that way it is easier to recycle the bottle and get maximum value for not just recycling but to be able to have more circularity in terms of the end use resin that is being generated okay. from the recycling okay. process before before i i ask tatiana about her her piece of plastic i have a question for you Mm -hmm. So within uh, Petco and the, the sort of the, the partners that you have, mm -hmm. a lot of them are, or some of the bigger players are international partners where this information is already known. So mm -hmm. is there a disparity between the packaging that is uh, sort of brought onto the African continent or, or to Kenya, let's just stick, it, stick, it, stick with Kenya, mm -hmm. and the rest of the world? Or is this actually a challenge for the particular producers across the board? Um, so I will say yes and no. 
Um, yes, um, there is a disparity in packaging. Um, when you get into some markets within the global north, you will find a lot of their packaging is already adopted to this type of thing. It's mm -hmm. clear the labeling is already very easy, can be recycled very easily. It's not as what well, is not like what we find in the global south. Why is that? It comes from obvious reasons. Businesses and um, most of these companies are fast moving consumer goods. There is a marketing consideration that is made. And we have also seen that um, whatever is happening locally will usually guide uh, what new players come in and do. So for instance, you will find uh, big brands, multinational brands, producing packaging of water in colored bottles that have the blue tint. Whereas if you go to a different market in Europe, the bottle is clear. So it's not that they're not aware of the design standard. It's that they have come to a market like Kenya. They have found that the bulk of players are packaging in that color bottle. And so for competitiveness or competitive advantage, mm. they think it's easier to introduce their packaging into the market with a similar kind of packaging. What we have done is to then now begin the conversation that switch it up. And we've started that conversation with the Kenya Bureau of Standards because this is the organization that then kind of creates a, um, some sort of impetus as to what is happening around the packaging sector. So if the Kenya Bureau of Standards creates that shift and makes it mandatory, then we will see more companies willing to switch and for multinational companies or operating within uh, some sort of commonality between what they're doing in Europe or the Americas and what they're doing in Africa. Mm, thank yeah. you. Uh, Tatiana, <laughs> uh, that's mute. Yeah, uh, so I had a plastic bottle as well, but to switch it up, uh, I have hand cream well with which all the washing hands because of coronavirus, my hands are really needing this thing. So I chose it because this one I bought like I don't know two years ago. Um, I chose it because it's one example of products that people buy because of what's inside of the packaging and that we don't buy because of the packaging of the product. Mm -hmm. So right now I buy my hand cream in bars without packaging. But uh, I didn't know that existed exactly. a few years ago. And this is a clear example of how the industry externalizes the costs yeah. of dealing with packaging so that they can sell their product to consumers. So more companies should be offering us the opportunity mm -hmm. to buy their products without packaging. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, I also discovered that you could buy, you know, shampoo and lotion, just you literally just pick it up. You don't need any packaging around it. But I feel like it, it's so far from being a reality mm. in Kenya or in Colombia. And that's where a lot of plastic waste is also, I mean, there's, there's as much plastic waste generated. So I'm not in two minds. I mean, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for bringing that as an example. But then I also feel like we're just, we're far away from it in terms of like a, a, whole, a whole global movement. I really hope that more companies go through and bring yeah. this. And, and it's like, like you see food deserts many times in communities where mm -hmm. some communities have access to these wonderful organic shops where they can buy all sorts of things. And then some other communities only have access to supermarkets where everything is full of additives and GMOs and there's also the same kind of barriers to access to some communities to plastic free stuff. Mm. So it would be great if more fast moving consumer good companies made these things affordable and accessible to everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much. Charles. <laughs> Thank you. The first plastic I have is this one. This is the non woven 
bank that replaced the single use carrier bank. And uh, the government intention of bringing this one was that they were going to be of good quality that can be reused. But what you find now is that they are very poor quality that are being uh, used and thrown away. And this now makes no difference. It's like, just like, just because they are not very light, you cannot see them flying in the air the way you could see uh, the single use plastic bag. So uh, the government has already talked about them and I think they may also be uh, banned uh, okay. from use because now they are a nuisance. People just buy and throw away, buy and throw away. It's something that you cannot keep in your house to go uh, shopping next time because it's of very poor quality. Uh, so, so I, I want to show you. Yeah? So if, for example, instead of banning them, we improved the quality and then sort of had a marketing campaign where you told people that, the re that they were supposed to reuse them, them, or you put a cost on them, would you think that that could change behavior? Sure, that could. If we had, the government sets up a campaign or some uh, CBOs start some kind of uh, campaign, and this is an in initiative that, is, uh, that can be done by everyone. It may not be necessarily the government uh, mm -hmm. uh, doing it, but it can start with the uh, manufacturer and the agency in charge is the KMA for Kenya uh, is the Kenya Association of uh, Manufacturer. Manufacturers and therefore I think they are the people who should take up this matter mm -hmm. and uh, impose staff measures that any company that produces poor quality non hooven bags will be charged and all this. I mean, it can be a polluter pay uh, <laughs> uh, exercise for this kind of thing. And I carried a bag. I carried this bag that I, I was given to carry some items from Canada. You can see if you use this kind of bag, mm -hmm. uh, you will be uh, reducing or removing five uh, bottles uh, out of the environment. Okay. And therefore, if we can be able to adopt this kind of uh, material that we are able to reuse for quite a number of, you can reuse this one even for more than a year, and that shall have reduced uh, quite a lot of plastic pollution. So this bottle with this one, you will not have this bottle in the environment. Okay. I also have... Uh, no, Charles, let, I'm very conscious of the time. <laughs> let's... Uh, let's... Yeah, 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 this one. Yeah, yeah. This, let Thank me you. make it. Let this one be the last. Okay. Thank you. So yeah. I have with me the, the piece of plastic I chose is this little small plastic um, container that contains one teaspoon of mustard seed. <laughs> I, I don't know if you can, I think you, can, you get it just from the way I'm holding it, but it's just, it's really small. Um, I've had it now for about a month and a half, maybe six weeks. And I can't, I don't want to open it because as soon as I open it, I have to toss it. There's nothing that I can use this for. Mm. And, and in, in terms of our discussion, marine plastics and some of the dangers of marine plastics, this size is something that a seagull can very easily swallow. Okay, so, uh, you know, we've heard from all of you and I, I just want to pose, I want to use this and pose a couple of questions to you. So, Perhaps, perhaps Joyce first. Um, so you deal with pet and you deal with sort of materials that need to be recycled. As we've discussed, like 
you know, there, there, there are various things that need to happen in order for something to be recycled and to make it easy to recycle this. This is clear, it's small, it doesn't tell me what kind of plastic it is. I'm not sure whether it's pet. I, I don't know, I'm not sure what it is. It, fe it feels hard, but yeah. How, how, how would your organization deal with something like this? <laughs> well, um, I think we need to all agree. And I think if we look at what the EU has done is to say that there's going to be a ban on some of the unnecessary plastics. Um, and so to me, what you're holding is unnecessary. Um, over and above that, it speaks to a larger problem where a manufacturer has put out a product without any labeling, without telling you whether that is PET, LDP, or PP. Uh, and so the question to the consumer is, so what? What do I do with this? Mm -hmm. And so for us, uh, in PET, we do have situations where some of the packaging that is going out does not have the letter, the number one on it, and that is a problem. And as I said, we are working with the Kenya Bureau of Standards to be able to make it mandatory that anything that is being put out, at least in the PET space and any other space actually, in any other uh, plastic polymer, should actually have its number uh, clearly showing on the packaging. Because mm -hmm. even if today I put out bins for, that's about, for segregated bins that ask Talash to put her plastics, her PET or her polyprop in different containers, Talash is not able to know what is what. And so to me, that goes against uh, designing for recycling. So mm -hmm. for me, I'd check it out. Um, Tatiana, is this probably one of the reasons why the EU, and I mean client Earth, has pushed for such regulation, but also how did we let it get this bad? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is a really great report by CL, the Center of International Environmental Law, showing the awareness of the major chemical and plastics industries about the problems that um, plastic would create for the ocean, for climate, for waste management. And basically, they knew this would happen since the 60s and the 70s. And they didn't care. They did it anyway. So it's a way of thinking about business, saying I'm just going to think in the short term, think about grabbing all the profits I can and pushing my way so that everyone else has to deal with it and pay for it. Mm. Uh, and when we have a model of capitalism, <laughs> and understanding of how society works, where we prioritize shareholder value and dividends, that's what happens. I, I think, so just picking up on a strain of what you said, maybe Charles, you can comment. When you see something like this, do you feel that science influences business or like business um, plans or models like, I know I can see Joyce is laughing. <laughs> yeah, when I see that, um, the first thing that comes into my mind is, if I may uh, recite what Tatiana began with, is that, uh, you know, when, uh, when plastics are made, they are what we call additives that are uh, done together with the plastic so that this will uh, determine the shape of the plastic, this will determine the color, this will also determine the strength of the plastic. And these additives are chemicals. And these chemicals are capable of, uh, of uh, the absorbing or they, they are capable of, the, the plastic is capable of releasing the, mm -hmm. the additives. And when they are released, 
then that is how they get into organism. Because the organism, as you've said, uh, it can be swallowed by that uh, the animal you talked about. Mm -hmm. When the animal swallows it, and it has the additives with it, mm -hmm. together with the other chemicals that has absorbed on it, and finds a conducive environment within the stomach, then the chemicals are released into the organism. And therefore, you begin to have a problem of their reproduction, things like that. Like if, for example, it was a bisphenol A, mm -hmm. then it will trap the endocrine, and therefore, the production of the organism is affected. I do, I do really wish that I, we had a little bit more time because I, I would have liked to get into the discussion on you know, the chemicals within plastics and, and what happens when they are actually released. I, I don't know whether there are concrete studies, um, but you know, we can't, I think we don't have that much time. Maybe we can look at some of the questions that came in. Um, I think Priscilla has asked the question. I'm not sure whether it's to Tatiana. But okay, it's how to track and charge companies for the plastic waste they produce. How can we do that? And, and maybe Joyce has a lot more to say about how this could work in practice. But what we have pushed for and were su successful in getting adopted at EU level were better requirements for disclosure and information of what companies put in the market in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that we know what's coming in so that we can attribute the costs of what goes out mm -hmm. at the end. So if companies need to tell a central authority we're putting X number of million of bottles in the market each year, then they can say, okay, so the cost per bottle with these eco-modulated fees, taking into account how well it is designed for reuse or recyclability are X. And there are other activities like sewage cleanings and beach cleanings mm -hmm. where companies need to be charged a proportional sum according to the amount of waste they, that is produced that is related to the products they place in the market. Okay, uh, Joyce. Actually, uh, Tatiana is very right. It's almost uh, the kind of model we use to create a pricing regime for our membership. Um, however, of course, full disclosure is usually very difficult to achieve, largely because these are competitors in the marketplace. And so there's a sense of wanting to guard their numbers. Um, and so what we do is we look at what they are producing. Um, most The beauty in Kenya, which is also a disadvantage, is a lot of the resin is imported. So in Kenya, we do not have any manufacturer of uh, resin, largely because we don't have refineries that are making this here. So because of that, we are able to work with our revenue authority to look at the amount of resin that is going into each of our uh, members. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we are able, at, with an estimate, using an estimate to determine whether the volumes that they disclose are close to reality. What we then do is to allocate 70% of mm -hmm. that into what our recycling target for the year is. So we have a strategic plan. Our desire is by 2030, we will be recovering 70% of what... <coughs> is generated in the country, not of just what our membership is producing, 70% of PET that is generated in the country, we will be recovering it by 2030. Mm -hmm. When we look at that, we know what the costs of recycling are. And so we say, if in 2020, we look to recycle, uh, to collect and recycle, say for instance, 9,000 tons, mm -hmm. how much do we need? And so, we started at uh, 5,000 tons, and so we've been able to create a price 
that allows our membership to provide money that we can use. 70% goes into recycling. Another portion, of course, goes into admin, but another percentage also goes into uh, the beach cleanups that Tatiana is talking about. The awareness raising, putting out uh, collection receptacles and other support uh, infrastructure that is needed to aid collection of this package. Okay, and, and I think, I guess a follow-up question that was asked at some point, Rasan Duff asks, mm. Joyce, could you expand on producer liability and what that means for, if, like, what that means for poor communities, I guess that's like, uh, will it be shared? Like, are these... <laughs> <laughs> so for us, um, because of course, uh, the waste management uh, value chain in Africa uh, and a lot of emerging economies, India included, you find the informal sector, which are really, uh, really a constituents of poor, economy, poor communities, are largely the waste collectors belong to that group. So what we have done is to look at how can we not just formalize them, we are trying to get into a system where we are um, trying to shift from dump site mining, which is really scavenging, as it were, to having segregation at source becoming the norm. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, scavenging still being very prevalent, we have thought how best can we then improve that environment for those people. And so we've put in uh, support, of course, to provide equipment, collection carts, bailing equipment, occupational health and safety training, financial management training for these people, just to upskill them so that whatever they are making uh, then goes into some better use and they can use it to improve themselves either for health or social welfare in, within their families. Over and above that, we are also working directly with government to remove the unnecessary licenses that are being charged to groups such as those. Mm -hmm. So the government now, because we have devolved functions, a federal-like system in Kenya, we are working with different counties to be able to alleviate that kind of burden among these communities. The other bigger problem is these poor communities are unserviced. So you find that they've been excluded from the waste management system. They don't have access to even receptacles or even adequate, even dump sites for that matter. So they create them on an ad hoc basis and usually it will be near a river system. So what we are doing is to work with the government to be able to designate areas and where you can have skips or receptacles that are easily accessible to these groups of people. So our first pilot project is in Kibera. It has been very successful. We have also been able to establish a buyback center, which in essence means we have brought the recycler to the source of this uh, material and where these poor communities can access the recycler directly. So we've seen a, a significant shift in the rates of collection but you see it's largely of PET and other plastics. So I'm mm -hmm. unable to speak to other waste streams. We have five minutes left. I really, I, I had so much more planned, but it's like we have five more minutes left. Uh, do you have any sort of parting words just in a, about a minute, Charles? Um, probably in relation to science and business, your research and how it influences or doesn't? <laughs> um, well, okay. Um, from uh, my research, you saw that uh, we still find uh, things like straws and, uh, and uh, all those kinds of plastic uh, that are still found around. And therefore, what I can say is that uh, we can uh, uh, go to that point of wanting to stop use of, uh, of straws, for example, because 4% is, is still quite uh, high enough uh, uh, to be found around the beaches. So my check is that uh, straws to go out of uh, use or out of business and I recommend things like metal straws like this one, or even uh, bamboo uh, bamboo straws like this nice. one. So uh, that is my button shot. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Tatiana? Um, 
with coronavirus and the COVID crisis, the plastics industry is pushing so hard to receive bailouts from the government and um, and also to take back regulations that have been implemented all around the world. Uh, don't let them fool you. <laughs> Plastic is not safer when it comes to coronavirus and many times they don't pay the, their taxes, they register in tax havens, they create their business models in weird ways so that they don't have to like provide their share. And also plastic production, like resin manufacturers, crackers, mm -hmm. they have so many health impacts. When you go and look at the health impacts of resin manufacturers in the UK, you can track them to weird cancer rates in populations of vulnerable mm -hmm. communities. Do not let your taxpayer money go to subsidizing even more of those companies' profits and the outrageous salaries of their CEOs. So use your voice and ask your governments not to bail out those companies and to go th through a green transition towards a better economy. Thanks, Tatiana. Joyce, <laughs> respond. I, I think I should have come before Tatiana. Um, <laughs> um, I think for me, uh, of course, is the clarion call to action for Petco is do one thing, recycle. Uh, we believe firmly and strongly in the producer responsibility model, which actually um, puts a burden of responsibility on those that are actually putting out the packaging into the environment and into the marketplace. So for us, it's how can we better implement this system while trying to achieve circularity and trying to work with government to improve the legislative framework that then creates a, a better natural environment and maintains a bottom line that doesn't render these businesses out of business. Mm. So, plans for expansion? Yeah, plans for expansion for us, as I told you, Petco is already in South Africa. We are in Ethiopia now and will soon be in Tanzania. Uh, the model is the same. Uh, and so for us, our plan for expansion locally is to be able to deploy uh, a lot of the pilot projects and initiatives into the 47 counties of Kenya. Thank you. And we've now come to the end of this discussion. I've really, really been privileged to have this, to be part of this panel. Thank you so, so much for your insights, for this discussion. Um, I really feel like we've learned a lot. Uh, for all the people who participated in the discussion, our participants, thank you also for joining us. Please also make sure to register for more ocean-themed events this week. Um, it is World Ocean Week. Uh, you can check out, check out the website, oneoceanhub.org. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you very much again and goodbye.